Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Through Conversations podcast, where we explore the cosmos, consciousness, and everything in between through conversations with the most brilliant minds. Today, I'm speaking with Stuart Alsop III. He is the host of Crazy Wisdom podcast. Instead of asking people what they do, he asks people why they do it. This conversation was mind-bending, amazing, really out of this world. We explored everything that's happening around the pandemic, what's happening around the psychology of the pandemic. We discussed Twitter, social media, if we're curious by nature, what does it mean to live under an uncertainty, the ego from the Eastern tradition's perspective, how can we cope with death? And if we could live for eternity, how long would it take us to become crazy? And many other ideas. This conversation was really amazing. Stuart is an amazing person. I truly look up to him. And one of the reasons I created this podcast was because I was inspired by his own podcast, Crazy Wisdom Podcast. I really hope you enjoy it as much as I did while talking with Stuart. This was an amazing experience and rather than creating prescribed questions or have uh, notes to help me with the interview, we decided to go off script and just discuss what's on our minds. And as you will see, there was plenty in our minds and I really loved it. And I'm looking forward to another edition of talking with Stuart. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Well, I'm here with Stuart also third, and I'm very excited, very honored for having you here in the show. It's it's quite a an opportunity because we're two fellow interviewers who try to to bring ideas to the to the table, and it's it's a good opportunity to just tackle our own perspectives on how things how things are and and you know let's see where where we go with this interview Stuart. cool thank you so much for having me on it's a pleasure i've been uh, I, I was uh, amazed that you interviewed john verveke and then actually introduced me to john verveke as well who's a he huge hero of mine and so i interviewed him so thank you very much for this and thank you very much much for that too as well yes definitely so john verveke is uh, as you mentioned he's he's quite a figure and the way he he talks about his ideas on neuroscience on meditation i've actually followed plenty of times his meditations right now in the pandemic he's given out like daily daily sessions of meditations very helpful and those are the people who who i want to to be surrounded with you know like yourself like john verveke who who actually want to engage with ideas and just try to uh, as your podcast it's, it's try to establish wisdom and when you approach your own interviews toward like how do you set the tone into trying to get the the grasp on on your interviews ideas like how how can you get the most of, out of an interview what's the best way to do it it's a good question. Uh, I'm sure I thought a lot of that about that in the beginning because I think I'm up to now 300 episodes for Crazy Wisdom, the, my podcast. And um, uh, in the beginning, I would you know give everybody a theme. I would uh, it was the stress between it was a relationship between stress and creativity. Uh, that was the theme that I was investigating, and I would kind of uh, you know give people a lot of information. And then now I just wing it. I totally wing it, uh, and it's and it's just and it's. I get in the conversation and somebody says something to me and I can't tell what I'm doing. I can't tell what about it interests me. Uh, and then I ask questions because for a long time I've, I've been at using social media to ask questions. So I would go on yeah. onto Twitter, go onto Facebook and I would just write one simple question and just, I, I got the behavior from Quora, this website, which was question and answer site and I became a top question um, asker. And so I got into this kind of, and then I just used that, what John Verbecki would say was, I exapted that behavior from Quora to Twitter and Facebook and all these other, uh, I still haven't used Instagram for question asking, but maybe I should, but, uh, yes. and, uh, and so uh, I started qu asking questions just to random people, random strangers on the internet. And then I, and then I started the podcast based on that. Uh, and I started to ask people 
questions. And I, that's what I thought the inter an interviewer's job was to only ask questions. And so I think most of my podcasts, I'm only, I'm, I try to only ask questions. I don't really speak that much about my own things or anything like that. Um, and then, and then now I'm getting more into, I've started to do solo podcasts now about, about, wow. uh, about my, um, experiences traveling in different countries and, and, and why I'm so interested in the rest of the world and stuff like that. So, uh, uh, so I, I don't, I don't really have a good answer to that question. I don't do anything specifically. It just, I just, I'm highly curious as I think you are as well. Um, and so I just go into it and, and figure, and I'm, I'm drawn to, I'm drawn to certain people. I don't know why I'm drawn to them unless it's a specific thing like remote work or cryptocurrency or something like that. But, uh, and then I'm, I'm just so interested in what they, what they can share. Wow. Yeah. Like there are so many threads there. I wanted to go your Twitter is one of the best Twitter accounts I follow, to be honest. The questions you ask, like plenty of pe people use Twitter to create a hostile environment, which we can go into, into deep conversation right now because I've seen your Twitter and, and it seems that you, you're a pro, like your perspective on it has become one that I, that I agree on and one that I've adopted that it seems that it's antagonized people And the irony of it is that technology has, has become a tool of separation. Like, and, and what's, what's impressive for me is not, not only that it has become a tool of separation, but we've adopted this narrative. And I, I think that's like a self-fulfilling cycle, right? We believing that it's a, it's a tool that it creates negativity and, and closed chambers. Therefore, it begins to do that, you know? Yeah. But your Twitter is something special because it, it's one of the few accounts that just tweets a question and makes you think about a question. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's gen, like, I, I could ask you, like, why do you do that? But it's, as, as you said in, in right now, you're a curious person. And that's one of the, the biggest things we, I think this, this society needs. Like, how, how does one... Can in, how does one enjoy and engage with the world mm. without being curious, right? Like everything changes without perspective. I, th I think uh, most people are curious by nature. Uh, there's this one book I read a long t time ago. I think it's by uh, this guy named Panskep, who's a uh, biology behavioralist or something like that. He studies animal behavior and he talks about seven prime emotional features that all animals share. Uh, and and the the one basic one that's been around with for us for a very long time is seeking the seeking circuit. So there's a circuit in brain. You know, when I go on Twitter, when I go search for food, when I go do anything like that, my seeking thing is off the charts. You know, that's what I'm doing. I'm seeking, and vast majority of humans are seeking all the time. That's why we have this information foraging. Um, and so that is curiosity. Uh, and I think in most people curiosity has been diminished because there's so much fear um, uh, because fear shuts down curiosity. Uh, right. And I, and I experienced this for a long time for many years before starting to ask questions. That's why Cora was nice because it was kind of anonymous. I could go on there and ask questions about it and mm. be somewhat separated from the brand of the person who's asking the question. Uh, and then more and more, I realized the question asking was the one of the most courageous things that we can do as human beings, um, particularly now, because uh, now you can, you can tell how serious is somebody about their own intellect actual uh, curiosity it's, or open-mindedness uh, is if you question them, do they shut down? Because um, if they shut down, it means that they're, they're tied themselves, tied their identity to, to, the, to, the, to the thing that they're talking about. And, and that's it. And that a lot of people are starting to do that because of what you mentioned, uh, which is a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think one of the major things that we can do as people who, 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 who like to consider a lot of different factors is basically remain in uncertainty um, and say, we don't know what's going to happen. I know we're in a self-fulfilling prophecy and a self-fulfilling cycle, right? And it seems that most people know that, like, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure uh, that most people don't want this to happen. But what happens is it, it connects with what we're talking about Twitter and everyone's plugged in like, like, And, and listening and reading these ideas, which are rather radical and, and not like people are mentioning really, really bad ideas and we're <laughs> all tuning into them, everyone. And what happens is that 
I believe what happens with me is that it has it, it must be the, the the whole consensus. What we're reading in Twitter, it's the most it's the whole consensus, mm. Mm. you know. And my question is, how do we get out of it? We we need to engage with uncertainty, as you said. But in a macro scale, like it it feels we're we're going automatically into this into this destiny like a part of us is yeah it's 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 the it's um so so i'm gonna rip off of john verveke here a little bit he he isolated a key term which is cognitive uh uh uh, uh, distributed cognition so you know a tribe of 150 people a tribe of 50 to 100 people in the in the jungle had a distributed cognition that was limited to that 150 people so uh, that was our evolutionary past was where it was a bunch of people with all trying to survive in the jungle and they all had the same beliefs and there was no really kind of dissent or except for maybe minor things about how to get the food and stuff like that until yeah. you ran into another tribe and then it would be a lot of dissent or why, you know, I don't know, want to get too much in my imagination there, but you have, you have this thing called yeah. cognitive, uh, co- um, uh, distributed cognition. Now add social media and distributed cognition has uh, changed to a crazy degree. And now we're hooked up, as you said, but we're hooked up to our own kind of thought spheres at immediate media environment. Um, so, uh, so you got this cognitive, uh, distribution and we are not prepared for it in the same way that we aren't prepared for, um, uh, limitless sugar everywhere. Uh, so we're kind of just like, we got to figure it out. Uh, and then the same way in the 1920s, I think radio was invented in the early 1900s. Radio was invented in the 1920s leads to people like, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who can talk really, really well and, and get a whole bunch of people motivated, also leads to Hitler. Uh, and then, you know, like also and then add the TV in there as well. And that's that's TV, particularly in the 60s and the 70s and later on. It's like then it goes into cable news and then you get mm-hmm. Fox News and you get, you know, I mean, Trump is, is probably very related to the fact that he was on both Fox News and also reality television, which are two themes that we aren't prepared for as well, yeah. now add social media. And so it all goes back to something that I learned from one uh, person I interviewed, uh, Elliot Pepper. And Elliot Pepper said that we are living in an age of acceleration. Uh, and so everything is going real, really fast, and it's incredibly stress producing. So we're all under a huge amount of stress to try to adapt our brain that has had all of these influences for the last hundred years, which are now coming to a head and uh, coming to another head because they've come to head, come to a head of various times over the past hundred years. Uh, and so we're going into that again. And I, uh, to answer your question, it might be a little bit of a pessimistic or a cynic. Uh, I don't think we, we have any control over where we're going. We've already, we've already gone into it and, and we're headed there and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so for my own, my own, I, I can't answer what other people are doing, but uh, for my own thing, I'm, I'm, and I think John Verbeke would actually agree with me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to wake up, uh, I, like, a, like a spiritual awakening. The best thing I can do for myself, my family, and those people who are closest to me, who can then maybe hopefully spread out beyond that, is to is to aim to wake up from the dream that I'm living in. Um, and the dream that we are all distributed in and the, that distributed cognition is essentially it's a dream because mm-hmm. when I look at the tree, I don't see the tree. I see, I see my shared illusion of the tree that you also see. Uh, and, and I think that's probably the best thing we can do is to aim unless you're in a position of power. But I think even in positions of power, it's no longer about the truth or uh, maybe if it was never about the truth, but um, uh if you're in a position of power, you, you've got so many other incentives to do the wrong thing, uh, as we've seen in this pandemic. So, yeah, yep. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's. Have you seen the movie Waking Life? No, no. Ooh, write it down. You have got to see it. Everyone who's listening right now has got to see Waking Life. It's mm. pretty much the the whole idea is that. I don't want to spoil it. I mean, I don't care personally about spoilers. I like to, you know, everyone to to tell the story, but I don't know if our listeners will appreciate it. It's a movie about this this guy who's in a in a journey, like a self discovery journey, and the reason why he's in a journey I won't say, but it's very spiritual. Like you have lucid dreaming. Is reality a lucid dream? And it it, it quite goes to your point that. What we're seeing, it's like a consensual hallucination. We're hallucinating this reality. And 
I would love, honestly, I would love for everyone like create a movement where we, we can all agree. I think we can all agree. And maybe this is my, my Kumbaya perspective, my like p peace and love. But I think we can all agree that we don't know what the hell are we doing in this life. Like we are born without a guidebook. We don't know what we're doing. But we can all agree that we want to live to our fullest potential, try to fulfill it or try to flourish as individuals or learn to understand our souls. Why are we here? Like everyone wants to unfold it. But if we're on each other's throats every single day and we can't plug in from Twitter, I would create a movement where say, let's, let's plug out. I, I told you via, via chat that I plugged out for one day, like mm -hmm. uh, deliberately, like being conscious about being plugged out. And I felt the urge of going into Twitter like a couple of times, opening my, my cell phone automatically. And I said, hey, hey, wait, like self-restraint. But I believe that if we don't tune into those negative notions, we can create reality because we're feeding towards that. And I don't know if it's as a collective, it's our desire to, to self-explode or it's individualistic notions of our, we don't know what we're doing here. Let's, let's. Let's create chaos or as you said before we can't handle uncertainty but right now with the pandemic what we're seeing and from my personal experiences now that i've moved into a new place you pretty much put it in in point with, before recording it uncertainty brings brings open doors and and if we can tune into that narrative that we don't know what we're doing here but we want to make the best of it it changes everything because you don't see the other person who is on the other side of the aisle asking for a policy. You don't see, you don't watch him as a rival. You say, Hey, he wants to make the best of the world. And that's his perspective. What can I grab from that perspective? Right. Instead of saying, no, you're hurting my identity. As you said, I want to touch on that because I don't know why I'd like to, to, to get your perspective on why does it feel like ideology? right now during my lifetime feels permeated directly to the ego and to mm -hmm. like it's it's completely attached to it our mm -hmm. egos are attached to our, our identities yeah and so i'm i'm going all over the place but you know it's exciting let's, it's exciting let's do it let's do it yeah I've, it's i thought about that a lot and i've read a lot about it and uh uh so we've got this thing called the ego and we can talk about the ego from the Western understanding, which is the ego, the super, super id. Uh, uh, I don't really know enough about it to, to go into that. Uh, but then there's this other thing, which is called the ego from the Eastern tradition, which uh, is, a, um, is kind of related to this word ahamkara, which is the eye maker. Um, and so uh, right now, I have a sense of being me, this existence right now. You probably have it as well. Uh, and so I've got this thing that's existing inside of me and that it seems really attached to my body, seems really attached to my mind. And it's kind of like a filter. That is my ego. Everything that's t talking right now is, is my ego. Uh, and it's not something that's bad. It's not something that we, need, uh, that we need to fight against because that would just be the ego fighting against it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just this, this whole sense of I what Ramana Maharshi calls the I thought. Uh, it's, it's, it's not real, it's, it's a virtual machine. Um, it's a virtual machine uh, developed over millions of years so that I can survive and get food and have sex and do all these things that, that, uh, that uh, and then humans have this ability to be aware of that virtual machine and then peer <laughs> into it and realize that it's just a virtual machine. Like it, wow. if I really ask myself, who am I? That answer, there's no answer to that question that I can give that will fully encompass what I am. Uh, so, so we've got this thing that the ego that helps us kind of survive, helps us have sex, helps us uh, do all these things that we need to do. And yeah. then uh, we have our beliefs. And so we've got this identity that's attached to the beliefs. Now the scientific material world that says we are just a stack of cells and, that are, that is tied to this virtual machine. And that's it. You're going to die afterwards. Total nothingness. That's it. That's everything. <laughs> Uh, uh, and says there is no God, there is no connection, there is no anything like that. That doesn't really allow for a place of, uh, of, of, of existence. So all we have now is this ego, uh, this I, I maker, which then has been kind of given a bunch of dopamine over the past 20 to 30 years. And well, with social media, you know, creating a Facebook account of 
what's called the idealized self. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've created this idealized self that we then put a bunch of energy into, which then further uh, develops this, this, this sense of the I thought, as opposed to I, the, the who, the me, the truly, the truly exists. But wow. we've developed it as this virtual machine that we can now look at and other people can look at and if they attack us. So, and then the, we've got the beliefs. And so we've got the beliefs that are holding up this identity that's a false identity. Uh, and then uh, so, and then some people were born in, into Democrat family. Some people were born into a Republican family. Some people born into a Democrat family uh, resisted and went the other way and became a Republican. And Others and the Republicans also resisted and went to the Democrats. And so we've got a long history of having these beliefs and a lot of narcissism that goes into upholding our beliefs and all this different stuff. And everything's just a reaction of something else. It's not, it's not something true or uh, it's just like a con what's called conditioning. And then, uh, so yeah, and, and so ego plus belief, upholding belief. And then there's another thread, which I got from Robert Sapolsky, which is that, uh, um, if you look at primates in their small groups and you have a have the leader of the group and uh everybody knows their place it's a hierarchy uh and then something comes along and kills as the leader uh every in that hierarchy state where everybody knows their place uh no stress hormones uh you kill the leader all of a sudden everyone is stressed out because nobody knows what the fuck is going on they don't know who the leader is and and then there's a dominance display where the where the all the 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 secondary ones start to fight each other, that's collectively what we're going through uh, as a species, not wow. at a global level, uh, because of the pandemic. Because all of a sudden, a pandemic came, uh, and and sh just totally destroyed our our faith in 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 well, for some people, uh, uh, destroyed our faith in 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 the systems at large, you know, this has been a long process where people have lost, and at least in the United States, have lost faith uh, in, in institutions for a long time, but I don't think it's limited to the United States. It's, uh, uh, I think it's pretty much everywhere. So yeah, we're in a global crisis where nobody knows who the leader is, nobody knows what's true. And, you know, we didn't know what was true before, but we had somebody who was kind of like, you know, who kept everything in together and, and, and they said that this is true. And so, but that we don't know, we don't, we, we don't really know it's true. So it's, it's causing that, I think. You know, I've never thought like it's the first time I think that the the posts that I that I put on Twitter on on Facebook, the the pictures that I that I post on on Instagram, are from my own notions of who I want to show others, like who I want to be. Like first, it may it may have started to to as a, as a you can see it from an evolutionary point of view, right? Like we're trying as primates, we're trying to to find mates, and we're trying to fuck. Our, yeah, and fuck. <laughs> we're trying we're we're trying to to put ourselves in in the marketplace by start, by putting our best self, you know, yeah. uploaded. The idealized then, self. Exactly, the idealized self, and then it, it as you said, it, it became. I think it it modified it merged into into my expectation of how I look at myself from the other points of view, like other people, how do I want mm. to be seen from others, right? With, mm. the, with my posts and then the feedback you receive on, on, on other people and on likes. Wow. Like it's, it's, it's amazing that we fed to that reality on, on we're living our present self and putting constant feedback, instant feedback on who we want to be. And then there's, and if those are in sync, it can be, be a whole mess, like identity wise. And, yeah. and, and in, in terms of our political leaders, as you mentioned, I don't think that we don't know who we are as a species right now. And the pandemic has showed us like, we can't, you said it, it's a whole different, it's a big problem. It's not just the pandemic. We're seeing healthcare. We're seeing psychology. We're seeing uh, affairs, marriages. Like humans don't know how to, to figure it out. And it seems that we, we don't know who we are. And then we don't know what to expect from our leaders. Like how do we, there's this theory that leaders are the reflection of us, right? And I don't know if, if the, right now our leaders have an identity, you know, they're, they're just, you know what I'm saying? 
Right. Yes, I do. Uh, yeah, no, and, and it's and I think it's exactly right uh, that that theory of leaders are a reflection of ourselves. Uh, and I didn't come up with this, but the there's the shadow. Each person, each individual has a shadow that they that Carl basically Jung. have. Yeah, yeah, Carl Jung and and uh, and then there's another point I'm going to bring in, which I got from somebody on YouTube, but I can't remember his name. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, we've got the shadow. We got the individual shadow, but there's also a collective shadow, and it's just coming out right now in crazy ways and then there's the other point of it used to be that only politicians would have to worry about the image making that you just said about who am i in reflection and who are these people looking at me uh, now with social media as you just mentioned as well it's a it's a totally distributed among the population to now have this idealized self that we look towards and we cultivate and we care for and we create um and uh so that's bringing up a lot of narcissism. Uh, and and I, I don't think narcissism, like there are definitely narcissists who are people who are like trapped in narcissism and like their whole thing is about narcissism. But I think also there's a lot of narcissism in each of us when we haven't fully integrated the shadow sides of our, of our being. Uh, and so we're starting to elect leaders who are really, really, really narcissistic. Uh, and uh, wow. yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. Like literally the our you know you mentioned also how how media and how the feedback between media and, and us have have uh created leaders and i'm working on an article it's in draft right now i'm working on an article that said that the, the future president the next president which i believe will emerge from this platform from podcasting from long-form conversation oh, interesting yeah because i i truly believe that the the debate was a catalyst everyone <laughs> the, yep. yeah the, the conclusion is what this is a, this is a shit show it, it can't keep on like this this form it can't keep on and we, we've seen also oh someone calling <laughs> give me one one moment sure yeah I think it's it's the matrix uh, calling score that we're we're, we're on. <laughs> they, want to, they want to end the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, as I was as I was saying before that, um, I believe that that the next wave of politicians will emerge from being. We've seen complacency, complacency like flourish right now. Like it's it's on the big time, all time highs. But podcasting, what makes is as as you and me are are like talking. We, we're not trying to dispute our ideas. Rather, we're we're trying to explore them. And I don't know how does a, de a debate like how does a debate or being a good debater like translates into being a good president when are you going to debate <laughs> right yeah yeah well and it's it's a little it reminds me of the the interview questions that you that startups have to put you through in order to become a developer most of the developers i know hate those interview questions because they have nothing to do with the actual job themselves but it's some sort of formality that we have to go through in order to get this job because they've developed a process and i think it's similar to the way that we're doing this conversation right now is how do you how do you two people meet together without an agenda and yeah. basically uh, just kind of discover the truth in mutual uh, conversation as opposed to having a pre-fit plan. And most people don't feel comfortable having, uh, not having a pre-fit plan. Like certainty is it, it, uh, because th that curiosity has been shut down in them because they worry so much about their idealized self. Um, and uh, and uh, so I think I think we're in a turning point and it's going to get really, really, really rough for a long time. Um, and, and, you know, maybe longer than either of our lives, but, but, uh, but at some point there's going to be a turn back towards truth. Mm. Cause I think the fundamental prog uh, progression of humanity is towards truth. Um, but uh, there's an interesting question I asked recently on Twitter is like, does, 
natural selection favor or disfavor uh, organisms' ability to discover the truth about themselves? Um, and uh, uh, I, I don't think there's a simple answer to that question. It might be both, but um, uh, but yeah, the the I think there are certainly some evolutionary advantages to not see the truth. And we have to get into what is the nature of truth, which can always get abstract or or uh, very uh, very subjective. Uh, so yeah. yeah, oof, that's a great question. And I've had uh, Isabel Benke, who is uh, an evolutionary biologist and evolutionary anthropologist. Uh, she she's a, an amazing person. She studied bonobos, and. I mentioned her in our conversation and I mentioned Nicholas Christakis, who is a sociologist, who is set to be on the podcast soon, but given the pandemic, he's working on, on, that, on that, you know, on that front, he's, he's an expert on that. And the threads he puts on Twitter are very, very helpful, just in information wise. But he said that we're going back into, into, political spectrums like there, there's this was very mind-blowing he, he there was this experiment conducted where I, I don't know how many people were surveyed into their political ideologies and then they were placed in the political spectrum like very right far right far left center you know they were put in this place and then they were asked to use to put towels with it and and mm. like grab their 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 sweat so you know they were transpiring and the sweat will come out and then they asked individuals who were coming to an experiment to smell the perfume and which one did they like the most and which one did they didn't like the most <laughs> and what's impressive i i cried i laughed and i was like i i had to stop doing everything that i was doing i was driving i had to stop because i was <laughs> The people who liked the most, per, like the, the, the scent that were, they were closer to, they wanted to, to have it, was a perfume who related closer to their own political ideology. <laughs> and vice versa. The one that they hated the most were like the, the, the ones at least associated with it. And it makes you think like the nurture nature debate, who are we and how, can, how much can we change? And it's it's impressive this is this is this goes into conditioning uh and i probably have a a, a view on this that is different from from the materialists who who uh, i don't know if they're materialists but uh so there's conditioning each of us has a conditioning uh, uh we're conditioned from a very young age to basically see things in a particular way and it, it is the nurture versus nature kind of thing any attempt to change that conditioning is another form of conditioning. So, <laughs> so it's just conditioning all the way down. Is there something that is beyond conditioning? And is there something that we can access or experience or, and this is nothing to do with faith or belief, but more about existence and our own subjective understanding of our existence is there something that is beyond conditioning um and what would it look like if we spent most of our time energy focused on getting to that state of a place that might be unconditioned and what would that do to our conditioning as well as a, as a byproduct wow we're on to something, and as, as I mentioned, the matrix. The matrix is. <laughs> <We can't. laughs> Which one would you, would you take? Would you take the red pill or blue pill? I take the yellow pill. <laughs> well, <what is> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I don't know. I, I I I don't have a good answer for that. Um, no, I definitely I definitely take the red pill because uh, because reality, and I think red pill is the one that that. The truth lets you see the matrix yeah 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 uh it's um I just like if if it's really challenging to understand a lot of the truths about nature for example that this body that i'm in right now will die all of my family will die all of my friends will die i will get weak i will get old 
uh, everything will come to an end in terms of this body. Uh, that's a really difficult truth to like really feel um, uh, and experience all the way through. And I, I still haven't got experienced all the way through, but I'm getting closer. Uh, and even though that red pill is really hard to swallow, uh, the benefits of doing that are just miraculous and they're, and they're not explainable. I can't, I, I mean, I could, I could try to convince you. I could try to sell you on the idea that you should do this, that you should fully viscerally understand that you're going to die. Uh, and I think Kabil Gupta, who we both talked about before, he does a pretty good job of it. Um, uh, 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 but just like, and he said that to me when I interviewed him, he's like, I asked him like, well, why should I do this? Why should I look at the truth? And he's like, there's no other option if you really think about it. Uh, there's no like absolute truth. And I'll, I'll give you an understanding of what I believe absolute truth to be. It's, it's, not, it's not objective truth because everything that has come through the subjective lens has all come through a subjective understanding. And it's the same for you. It's everything that you've ever experienced has all come through the subjective. And so uh, absolute truth is a subjective understanding experience of reality. Uh, and I would say that the I thought that we were talking about earlier, this who, when you ask yourself the question, who am I? There's this experience of being in a body, ego, believing that there's this world out here that's real exactly the way I'm seeing it. It's not really true. That's gonna die. That's all gonna be dying. But the one witnessing that, that's true. That's always been there since before I can remember having a body. There was, there was existence before that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's, I, I, that's what my sense of absolute truth is. And that's, that's what I'm aiming to integrate. I've the, the, the last couple of interviews that I, that I've done in the, in the podcast have been related to, to death and legacy. And it, I, I would love to ask you, like you mentioned that you're trying to, to cope or, you know, come into more terms with, with one's death and, everyone else's death and you know ceasing to exist and that's one of the main issues for me like personally i'm i'm, I'm i have a hard time like getting I, at least being i don't know how to put it like they, being aware of your own the 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 limitless limited nature of your own existence yeah like it's it's It, it it obviously has come has got to come from a from a fear based place right like that that's the way we've managed death and the conversations but how have you managed your inner dialogue like ceasing to exist you know you, you mentioned the benefits that may come like but the like the practice of actually doing it how how have yeah. you done it yeah well it's I've had a particularly difficult, uh, so before I go into it, there's, there's many, there's a few universal fears that human beings have. And two of those main universal fears are fear of death and fear of going crazy. So you're not alone. Um, everybody experiences it. And everybody who does not currently experience it because they've gone, they've had an experience of it in their bodies of the ego dying, they have once had that same experience. So they, they know, maybe not recently. Uh, I'm not there yet. I've, 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 But in the past two years, I've a part of me has desired to experience, uh, uh, to fully viscerally understand what it means that I will die. And, and there's a difference between the intellectual mind understanding it because the intellectual mind will create a theory of it and will create like this walled off abstract concept of death. Uh, but when we really experience it, when we, when we have that kind of the terror that comes from realizing that. And, and I think that's the only way to do it is to actually experience that and, and ask for more of it. So to, to, to recognize that there's this part of me in my body that learned from a very young age that this conditioning that death is bad. Death means nothingness. Death means that this whole thing is going to come to an end. Uh, that that was a child that, that made up that idea, that abstract concept. And it's a, it's shared that, we all have similar under an abstract concepts about death, but we don't really know what death is. Um, the, the mind can never know what death is, uh, uh, cause it hasn't experienced it yet. So, so, um, so, I, and, I, and it, it's not like I say like, Oh, okay. If you get to this point, you will then realize that you won't die, but your body will die. And that's okay. Because, you know, it's like, we don't really know. There's no, there's no like, 
we, we, n none of us have experienced death and then fully come back and said, this is what death is like. Um, because he didn't die. He came back into the same body. It's like you know, all the people with the, the, the near death experiences. Mm. Um, those, yeah, those another who thing. Said, yep. Those who said that they, they've come from, from death, like they're, 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 they have resuscitated. We believe they're crazy. So it's, we're in a, in a, in trouble. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Go, go ahead. No, no. And that, and that, that actually ties in with what I was going to say is that near death experiences uh, uh, can often lead to really, really profound shifts in meaning in life because yeah, you, you've had this taste of death uh, that, that uh, and so you recognize the value of life. And that's another big thing is that nobody really is living until they fully experienced uh, the ego death. Um, uh, because there's always this inner child that has basically made up this abstract idea of what death is based on other people telling that child what abstract death, their own fears of abstract death. And it's a distributed cognition of a virtual machine of death, not death itself. Um, and so, uh, yeah. And so I, I think it comes down to desire and desiring to know the truth. Uh, and, uh, and another thing you asked how, and how is a, uh, is asking for a method, um, or a prescription or yeah. And so I could say desire, desire is going to be the way. Um, but if you're into prescriptions, then also there's iboga. <laughs> uh, iboga is a plant medicine uh, that comes from Gabon and Cameroon in Africa uh, that simulates a sort of near-death experience. I didn't experience a death, but it definitely brought up all my resistance to this this stuff that we're talking about, and that one was very powerful. Wow. Um, yeah, that's that. That was one exactly what I wanted to mention: uh, the role of psychedelics in, in spirituality. Oof. I, pretty much there, there's been substantive amount of studies where people who, who are nearing death and say that they, they've taken mushrooms, for example, they are not, they, they don't fear it anymore. And that's, that, that's impressive. And yeah, so no, I, I wasn't particularly asking for prescriptions, but you put it right. Like the way, the way that I'm trying to ask you the question is to try to, to make, make it more certain, like, you know, what has been your own process so mm -hmm. it doesn't feel weird once I'm doing it. Yeah. As yeah. you say, it, it's, it's a, it has to be one's journey. It has to be my journey into, into coming into terms with ceasing to exist. And I believe that younger generations like we don't need to tell them you're gonna die <laughs> it's not a it's not it's not a good idea but i believe uh -huh. that the way we <laughs> yeah the way we the way we relate with with the world the way i relate with the world becomes pretty much different in like three 180 degrees in the sense that i'm humbled and i say i won't be here all the time there's people who have been before me the earth has been whew, plenty of millions of years before me and it will be after me. So how can I manage my time here and pass the baton in a, in a tr honest way, in a truthful way, my own self-discovery without hurting others' chances of self-discovery. And that's, that's the big theme. Like th th that's one of the, the biggest things I want to do in my life is to try, try, try to create my own journey without hurting the others who for example, take my children or take their children. They don't have a saying in the world they will, they will inherit, right? But it is very likely that me and my friends and my community, my, my network b begins to have children. And what will the future look like for them? Will they get even the chance to ask themselves, why am I here? That's, I, I think that it closely relates to getting to understand that we're not here for for the for eternity and it's okay to feel that way how if you if there was a world where you could become eternal uh how long would it take until you crazy you get what i'm saying yeah uh, how many how many you know times would you have sex before having sex lost all meaning or how many times would you eat a cake or all these and things, all these life pleasures that seem to give us so much joy. If that went on for eternity, 
how long would it be until you wanted to push the button and actually kill yourself? Have you seen, have you seen Groundhog Day? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've actually, I, I saw it just a couple of months ago for, for the first time. During the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is like Groundhog Day. It's, it's yeah. Much like Groundhog. Yeah, but I think that, yeah, you pretty much, you, your point is taken, like, it, eternity, uh, it, it's, our, my desire to live a long life in the sense, like, putting it personally, because I, I'm thinking of, for example, Yuval, Yuval Arari, who says that we're nearing immortality, right? We, we, immortality. Immortality. Not immortality. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Immortality. Yeah. Like 500 years. Like we, we're not going to die for natural causes. Just a car will, will crash and we're going to die. Yeah. Like, I don't know why we have this, this, this desire, like to live, to live forever. So, so I'm going to give you an interesting twist to that, which I haven't heard about yet. So take that amortality kind of abstract uh, future belief about what the future will bring. Now add it to what we've understood about the pandemic. So, uh, so the the kind of the organ institutions now at large are trying to basically save lives, lives no matter what, mm. at any cost we will save lives. So, which leads to a fear of life. So many people right now are so deathly afraid of life because of this abstract concept of death that they've that they've inter that they have not integrated yet. Um, and, uh, and now add a mortality to that. So add, everybody gets another 500 years, but you st still can get hit by a bus. You still can get hit, stopped by civil war. Mm -hmm. It means like the total loss of life as it is for a abstract concept of, oh, okay, I'm so afraid of death. I'll just continue this ho like horror nightmare. Like this last seven months, I, I, I don't know how, like I, I, before, before the seven months, I was actually in about a three to four month, very internal spot. Actually, actually last seven years have been extremely internal. I've done 15, 10 day meditation retreats wow. where I'm on my own for 10 days, not talking to anyone. Uh, uh, so I am, I am like, I have trained better for the pandemic than probably anybody else on this planet or uh, many other on this planet. There's people who have done more than me. Uh, and I have never had been so challenged over the past seven months. So I can't even imagine what doing to somebody who uh, uh, doesn't have the privilege of, of money, who's lost their job, whose family is dependent on them, who can't see their parents, who can't see their, like, it's just the mental health crisis is just out of this world. Yeah. Uh, and and um, uh, and I, 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 I'm, I'm worried that the, the wealthier of us who are going to kind of try to go for this life extension thing are going to make life itself unbearable for those who, who don't have uh, uh, the means to do that. It's worth adding to the, to the mix what John Verveke wrote in his book, uh, Zombies of the Western Culture. It's, we're in a meaning crisis. And add to the fact that we're in, in a crisis like a literal one with a pandemic, and as you say, the, the mental, mental health, it's the biggest challenge because you're, I, I was fortunate to be with my family in the, in, the, in the lockdown. Like I wasn't truly alone. And I don't know, right now I, I'm, I'm alone, but I'm going out. The, mm. you're in, everything's open mm. right now in my location in Florida. But I, 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 as you say, like putting, if I would be alone for seven months with no job, with nothing, I don't know if I, I would have handled it. And, yeah. and I think it goes into, you know, analyzing from a, a bigger scale that if I would know who I am without the labels, without the prescriptions, without my background, it would have been much like putting, imagine it, it would have been easier. But right now we're, we're grappling with the fact of we're not, we don't know who we are and we can't get out of that idea because we can't get out, <laughs> you know? And, and I think there's a fun 
Milo paradox there too, which is that there's, there's never going to be a point at which you say, oh, this is who I am, because that's the ego creating an, uh, a, a, an image of this thing that is just like multivariate, complex to the, you know, combinatorial explosive conversation would say like, this, 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 this being that I am is not something that can be said, hey, this is it. This is, this is, this is me. I found it. I found the real Stuart. It's inside here. It's like, there's, there's it's just like, exactly. it's not yeah. going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like I, 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 I've thought about it. Like we, I asked them, I asked myself, like, will I get to the point where I know who I am? <laughs> and if so, <laughs> that, that's, that would be entirely false. Like it, it would be an illusion. And that would be taking the blue pill. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. you could treat it as a, as a joke too, because it's kind of a joke. You know, it's, you just got to laugh because uh, there's an exercise that you can do and anybody who's listening can do it. And now it's basically, so I'm aware, you're aware, we've got this awareness. And every time that my brain points itself, instead of pointing myself out towards you or out towards the food or out towards whatever I'm seeing, um, I can point my focus onto the awareness itself. And, and but then, what is the thing that's focusing on the awareness itself? That's awareness as well. So it's all just one big awareness thing. And you can keep on going back and be like, well, what is the awareness of the awareness? Who's being aware of the awareness? And you can keep on doing that for like exponentially. Uh, but the ultimate thing is you run into laughter because it's all, it's, you can't figure it out. It's the matrix. It's like, we're stuck in the matrix. You can't stop trying to escape from the matrix. It's there. You, the, trying to escape from the matrix is just another eco game. Yeah. One of, the, of, of my questions for you is, if suppose suppose we we are with in the mind of Kapil Gupta right now, how does he like his day to day life in a he sees society as a as a as a prison right? How does how can I engage with with some? Let's say I'm enlightened, right? How can I engage with the outer world where I know it's it's false? Like how how do you do that? It's, I think never... I think it goes. I, I, and again, I'm not. I don't. I don't claim to be enlightened. I don't claim to have have a, a, an awakening experience that can give me give you get, that can transmit a actual understanding of what that state is like. I've got hints of it, but I'm not. I'm not there yet. Uh, but again, I think it would go back to the benefits. The the unknown benefits to it are are um, are just like is it's just like well why why do you want to know the truth why do you want to know the truth because oof, I, uh, it's, there, there's there's nothing that attracts me more than you know from 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 my own personal ideas that being honest and trying to be transparent and that living a life that says I'm not going to, to live a truthful life. I think that's, that's the way I would put it because I don't think I'm seeking truth. I'm trying to live a truthful life. And I don't know if, how do I, the, the way that I, that I go into life, the way that I engage with my daily routine, the, the way I try to to be with others, like it's trying to seek truth, but by being truthful, like why do I want to, I don't know if I answered it. Why do I want to look for for the truth is, I don't know, I think it's engineered in me. I don't know, like it's- <laughs> Yeah, I'm, so I'm something curious. deep inside you. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious about, about where, can it, where can my life lead if, if that's my, my objective, like I want to learn the truth, How, where, where can I go? What, mm. What's my life story like? Could I offer that maybe there's something in you that recognizes everything that you're experiencing right now as filtered through this thing, this virtual machine might not be all there is and that there's something more out there or there's something less out there. Um, but that, 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 that the way that you're currently seen or the way and the way that, that I'm currently seen is not, it's just, it doesn't seem like it's, it's, it's the whole picture. Right. Yeah. And so part of you is that way. Uh, and then another part is same with everyone else too, has this fear of death and fear maybe of going crazy. The fear of going crazy was larger than the fear of death for me. Um, and, and, 
and so part of part of you may want to avoid looking at the truth but then there's another part of you that does want to see the truth right and so which one is which one is bigger which which one is the uh, uh which one do you want more i think is the is the key question that's that's one that i i need to you know think on and and see maybe maybe throughout my life it has been more on the denial it has been perhaps with the illusion of, of, of finding the truth, but being like, as you say, putting, putting it in, in an intellectual box, right? Like I, I, I'm, I'm pursuing truth, but perhaps that's, As, that's my shield, you know, from the actual. I think, yep, yep I would agree. Yeah. Cause that's, uh, and also I, I think you're, you're young as well. Um, but, uh, so there's, 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 there's like, you know, just your biology is, is, is still focused on, on, things that it, it needs to do in order to to survive but then uh but then there's another kind of big thing that young people in the past didn't have that luxury who had that luxury where we don't where 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 things are getting pretty hectic uh and so finding the truth might make you more anti-fragile uh, uh when it comes to the experiences that we have in store for us hmm. wow I've, wow. Please expand on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, there's a, uh, I came up with a question a, a long time ago that uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb talks about uh, anti-fragility. He wrote a yeah. book called Anti-Fragility. And his idea, understanding of anti-fragility comes from having fuck you money. So the ability to make so much money that you can say F off to anybody who tells you what to do. I, I, I'm, I'm all in favor of that. I actually really, really, I think there's a lot of value in it. But I think it, there's there's one more step, and so what is the spiritual equivalent of fu money, um, or uh, and uh, and and how and obviously the other thing component is anti fragility. How can instead of being fragile and collapsing when there's stress, uh, being resilient when you can handle stress? Anti fragility is that you actually grow from stress. Stress, mm -hmm. uh, and so what is the spiritual equivalent of that? Uh, and that would be realizing that this world that we both are so convinced is real might not actually be the whole thing. Um, and that there's this thing that's so silent, this awareness inside of us, this subjective existence that we are constantly feeling constantly that most intimate part of who we really are. Uh, if we identify with that, as opposed to identifying with this, you know, our political beliefs or identifying with our uh, or even our spiritual practices or our, you know, the things that we eat or the, you know, all these silly things that we do. If we were to identify more fully with that unbroken, unstruck awareness that is ever present, uh, limitless, uh, that we could survive. Mm. Maybe even thrive during this, this time period that will, you know, I, I, I think Jesus had some actually good words when it comes to what I'm about to say is like, we are going to try to collectively fit our psyche through the pin of a needle. Uh, like the psyche will not survive. It's, it's, it's it, the things we have in store for us are going to be so challenging that we cannot hold on to these silly beliefs about what we think is true. Cause it's just so obviously not the truth. Like nothing we like, We've had thousands of years to try to, you know, civilization trying to figure it out. And we're so like, it feels like we're so close to the brink that, uh, uh, yeah, who knows, but. I, I, that's like going back into the, the beginning of our conversation is that it, it feels that like we, we both, I, I think we stay safe to say that we both feel like we're approaching into an era that's, that's going to be rather challenging. And it's, our, I think that our belief it's making us be near that and perhaps it's the best way to get as you said get better to closer to the truth because if we were still on this trend we would be more and more away from ourselves and perhaps that's not the purpose of being here so maybe it's our own like our own unconscious desire to to reset to put the reset button and that puts me I connected it with what I wanted to, to talk to you before that I believe that the tools we've created right now up until today as Zoom, as talking right now and AI and everything, 
in in an evolutionary sense we our biology hasn't come up to date that's why we're so anxious we're not used to instant feedback we're not used to mm. to trading like big you know what i'm saying like technology i i don't know how but it seems like it it has gone to exponentially increasing and mm. we're left off like trying to rationalize everything that's happening yeah right yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's a that's a big one, and glad you brought it up. Because uh, it's highly stressful, and I and in some ways I do think you know I don't know if you remember from John Vervecki's thing about the axial age and how in 800 BC um, there was a shift. There was a huge uh, environmental destruction. Uh, uh, there's uh, they ran out of tin. Uh, tin was a very important element and they ran out of it. So, it, you know, it led to the Bronze Age collapse uh, and uh, as chaos everywhere. And, and then all of a sudden these thinkers came, Plato, um, Socrates, uh, all, all these really deep thinkers started to bring out ideas that humans had never, ever thought about before. Mm -hmm. I think we're, we're at the end of that era that started with Plato and we're at the potentially longer than either of us will live uh, uh, descent before what is what what comes uh, uh, which is something new, and that something new might look very different, and it probably has a lot to do with the melding between mind and 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 uh, uh, technology. Uh, for I, me, I grew up. What's that? Transhumanism, you say, like. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe something like that, maybe something different, maybe something we haven't been able to picture yet. Um, uh, but yeah, for, for me, I grew up in a time where I only got my first computer when I was like 13 or 14, and I was actually ahead of most of my other peers uh, um, because of that. And so I've still got this taste of what it was like before everything happened. Uh, and, and, and the more that I, more that the technology gets insane the more that i go back and be like oh okay i get it what my parents were talking about i want to go back and live like a healthy life in nature and stuff like that and like uh um and then you said it before too about like how you got off of all the technology for a day those times are really important it's really important to have that agency over being able to detach from but also recognize that any move to detach from technology means that there's a piece of shadow that hasn't been looked at um, mm. about why you're, why this, this piece of technology is giving you so much juice uh, and, and, and the, the reaction to that, the moving away from technology will then allow you to escape from looking at whatever it is that's drawing you into the, into the technology sphere as well. Um, because uh, the the real challenge, the real kind of guru thing, would be to basically like use that in a way that is beneficial for all beings. So how do you use technology in a way that's all? And that might be giving it away, but if it's the abstract ego that says, "Okay, I am going to give this up for three days because I believe that this will lead to this feeling," you know, it's a pleasure chase. It's the same thing that Kapil talks about. It's like a pleasure chase for for trying to find that. That, that trying to engineer a future state of pleasure by doing these things, by, by willing our body and forcing our body to do these things that we want to do. Oh, it's so, so difficult, man. Like <laughs> trying to, it's paradoxical that trying to, to get out of the pleasure, pleasure chasing mind can actually be- It's a pleasure chase. Pleasure chasing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's all, it's, it's it, and there's tons of, tons of paradoxes. So, so like, uh, uh, it's the desire for truth that will that will lead to anti fragility, or the desire to fully uh, uh, integrate and understand the the the, the truth uh, that will lead to this. The you can like it's like you know it's like a wave. It's like you know it's like oh oh I'm I'm doing great I'm doing great oh shit oh I'm doing great I'm doing and then you just like even it out until you until you meet that singularity and then all of a sudden you get dropped into infinity, um, uh, uh, and. Uh, and then I haven't I haven't reached that infinity point yet, so I I, I can't can't say what's there. But uh, um, and it's you know it's just like it's somewhat meaningless for me to talk about it because it's like uh, I just don't know what's there, um, and I can't can't describe it. But I imagine that it would lead to a lot. Like you still go on the waves, the ego still goes along the waves, but you don't feel like you're going on the waves. You're witnessing all the waving stuff. Oh. Stuart, I think that. Right now, 
you know, talking to you for the first time in, in, in like in a podcast forum has been wow. And one of the questions that I've answered, not like directly on, on Twitter, like answering, but I, I retweeted it from you was that you asked how it, it was related with our limited perspective. And what I'm astonished is how can we, for example, right now engage in such a mind bending conversation and like it, honest, it, it was very honest and from both sides, it's amazing that we can talk about infinity and putting into in, putting it into the table with such a limited perspective. And I, I really look forward to doing this a couple of more times or more with you. So. Yeah, let's do it. I'm down. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for this and, and I'll, I'll stop recording right now. For sure. Thank you.